What time is it? Can you imagine a more ordinary question? We think about time often. Our favorite children's tales begin with once upon a time. We urge our guests to stay a while. We divide and govern our lives by a day, an instant, four score, and you know. Scientists also ponder time, sometimes though for different reasons. Maureen Ramo, a geologist, uses fossils of animals that lived long ago as a time machine to summon Earth's past and gaze into its future. Everything that's happened in the past tells you about the history of the Earth. It provides an analog. If you're a climatologist, you look to the past and say, you know, what, what happens in the world when climate does this? Recently, Ramo and a few other rock and fossil hunters scouted southern Australia for beaches left behind by a sea level higher than today. Sea level rises and falls depending on how much of Earth's water is frozen at the poles. When the planet is relatively cool, more ice freezes at the poles, and sea levels go down. During the last ice age, for instance, huge glaciers covered much of North America and Europe, the oceans dropped by about 300 feet. When Earth is hotter, by contrast, polar ice melts and oceans swell. How cold or hot Earth is depends in part on the gases in our atmosphere. Gases like methane and carbon dioxide insulate the Earth, trapping heat near the Earth's surface the way a blanket keeps you warm in bed. These gases explain why Earth is warm and full of life, Whereas the planet Mars, with a wispy atmosphere, or our nearby moon, with no atmosphere, are cold and inhospitable. But too much of these insulating gases, the so-called greenhouse gases, can be as detrimental as too little. The planet Venus, swathed in a dense atmosphere rich in carbon dioxide, has a surface the temperature of molten lead, Human beings began adding significant amounts of carbon dioxide to Earth's atmosphere about 150 years ago, when we began burning coal, oil, and gas for our homes, cars, and factories. The result? The Earth is now hotter than it should be, a degree and a half hotter than in the late 1800s, and growing steadily hotter. This extra heat is now melting the polar ice. 22 east. Okay. But how warm will it get and how much ice will ultimately melt? The fate of hundreds of millions of people living near the sea depends on the answers to these questions. Nobody knows. That's why Maureen Ramo is here in Australia. She hopes to attack the problem by studying beaches left behind by previous natural incidents of global warming. We are focusing on a period of time, three million years ago, called the Pliocene, that various lines of evidence suggest had the same CO2 level as today. Ramo's crew of fossil finders dug up evidence of a shoreline dozens of miles back from and tens of feet above Australia's present coast. They found fossils of shore-hugging corals and shells and marsh muck in the middle of what is now unbroken desert. They suspected that the ocean rose up and left these deposits during the Pliocene. When the Earth subsequently cooled off a little, this evidence of past higher water was left stranded inland. Are we walking this way? But proving this hunch would take lab work back home. I think when you go into the field, you kind of have a sense for how old a deposit will be. But the true test of your understanding in the field will come when you come back to the lab and actually do the analysis and see what that age is. These gowns don't just protect us from the dangerous chemicals that we use in the, in the clean lab, but in many respects, what we're really doing is protecting our samples from all the dirt and contaminants that we brought in from the outside world. The lab is a warren of windowless basement rooms at Boston University. Jeremy Inglis, 
The lab's manager says the air here is filtered so that it contains virtually no dust particles, making it 1,000 times cleaner than the air of Boston streets just a few steps away. It has to be because a tiny speck of dirt not visible to the naked eye could ruin an experiment. In actual fact, we are the dirtiest things that, are, that come into the lab. Everything else is squeaky clean. The porcelain-like shells Ramo brought home are composed mostly of carbon and calcium, two elements abundant in seawater. The shells also include other less common constituents of seawater, such as the element strontium. For about every 1,000 calcium atoms in the shells, there's no more than a few strontium atoms. Remo calculates how long ago the animals lived by extracting and examining this strontium. The different isotopes of an element weigh different amounts, but chemically they behave almost exactly the same. Isotopes are different versions of the same element that have a unique weight because they have a different number of neutrons in their nuclei. For example, every breath you inhale contains a mixture of oxygen 16, 17, and 18. But you've never noticed. Seawater contains approximately equal amounts of strontium-87 and strontium-86. But the exact proportions of these two isotopes in the ocean has changed since the time of that elevated Australian shoreline. That's because the strontium in rocks on dry land have different proportions of the strontium isotopes than seawater. When water and wind erode mountains and hillsides, the element is washed into the ocean, altering the sea's ratio of isotopes. So a very old organism would have a very low strontium-87, and a very young um, organism becomes enriched in strontium-87. Inglis grinds up pieces of shell into a fine powder that he then dissolves in acid. Here, he's extracting strontium from calcium and other elements in the milky mixture. The tube under each funnel is packed with a compound called a resin. The special resin is able to um, bind onto all the strontium that you've loaded, but not bind onto the rest of the elements um, in that dissolved shell material. So all those non-strontium elements, such as calcium, are washed through the column, whereas the strontium sticks in place and is bound to that resin. Later, Inglis will rinse the resin with super clean water, releasing pure strontium. By the end of the painstaking process, Inglis will have produced a solution containing a smidgen of strontium about the size of one hundredth of a single grain of sugar. This minute quantity wouldn't leave a visible stain dried on the bottom of your coffee cup, but it's enough for Inglis to determine the proportion of strontium isotopes that swirled in seawater long ago when Ramo's shells were being formed in seawater. With that information, he'll calculate how long ago that was with a sophisticated machine next door. This is a Triton mass spectrometer, and it has a number of components to it that work to um, produce an isotopic ratio. BU's Triton mass spectrometer is one of the most advanced instruments in the world for measuring the ratios of isotopes. Inglis dabbed minuscule droplets of his strontium solution onto a fine wire called a filament. He mounts the wire into the spectrometer, seals the sample chamber shut, and pumps out the air. Then we heat that filament up like a light bulb. The strontium, or any other element that we're interested in, gets ionized, and it goes into the second part, which is the flight tube. Um, the flight tube has a 90 degree bend in it and at that 90 degree bend we have a big electromagnet and that electromagnet is the workhorse of the, of the mass spectrometer. That magnet separates the strontium-87 from the strontium-86. The atoms hurtling through the spectrometer's flight tube have been ionized. They've had their electrons stripped off, giving them an electric charge. When they pass through the magnet's field, they swerve from their straight path, 
The two isotopes of strontium from Ramos fossils have slightly different weights, so they swerve by different amounts. Inglis says they act roughly the same way vehicles of different weights behave when careening around a tight corner. Think of Ferrari sports car and a Mack truck. The Ferrari, which is lighter, can take that bend at a much tighter angle, whereas the Mack truck has to take a much wider angle. So the magnet bends the lighter and heavier isotopes into different trajectories. And what did Inglis discover? He calculated that the shells from that elevated shoreline in Australia did live about three million years ago during the Pliocene. The Pliocene was hot, several degrees Fahrenheit hotter than today because there was more carbon dioxide in the air then. As you see in this graph, the average concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere has been dropping almost continuously since that time. The planet cooled so much we began having ice ages. Then, about 150 years ago, when humans began burning massive amounts of coal, the long-term trend abruptly turned around. In just over a century, the concentration of CO2 has returned to the level it was three million years ago. Pliocene-like warmth and higher sea levels are sure to follow. Ramos' team had measured how much higher the old Pliocene beaches are above today's sea level. But there is more work to do before they can figure out how much polar ice melted to form these beaches. Now, the problem is the sea level is going to be slightly different all over the world. Most of Earth's land buckles and tilts and seesaws up and down as the continents drift across the face of the planet. Ramo says her team must take such effects into account to interpret their results correctly. For instance, if you're standing on the east coast of North America, you have to take into account the fact that the recent ice sheet, the ice sheet of 20,000 years ago, has depressed because of its weight all of North America. Ice sheets also exert a powerful gravitational attraction making sea level higher in the areas near them and lower further away. Ramos' team is studying how to correct for these and other effects. They also plan to corroborate their results by identifying and studying other Pliocene beaches on other continents. We knew from the outset that to really answer the question properly, you would need a lot of data from a lot of different spots around the world. With a long-term grant from the National Science Foundation, Ramo plans to continue studying her Australian samples. She's also planning new sample collecting trips to India, South Africa, and elsewhere. She hopes her results will give scientists new insight into how Earth's ice sheets will respond to the planetary warming caused by the growing amount of carbon dioxide in the air. And she hopes that solid research showing how the warming threatens to flood coastal cities will help the public decide how to respond.